Hey, welcome and thank you for joining. My name is Linda Denute and I'm a health educator for community health at Atlantic Health System. Today's presentation, the importance of cancer education, screening and advocacy in the black community will be presented by Dr. Tachavo. Before we begin, I have a few announcements. This webinar is being recorded. All participants are muted. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button and the chat for comments. We'll try to get through all questions at the end of the presentation. Are you or a loved one interested in smoking cessation? Atlantic Health System offers a free quit smoking program. This program includes an individual assessment, free nicotine replacement products, and six weekly group meetings to help you quit and stay smoke free. There are multiple dates and times available with groups available in person or virtually. For more information about these groups and other resources or for additional dates and times, please call 1-844-472-8499. All right, so I've been uh, tasked with the uh, honor of talking about the importance of cancer education, screening and advocacy in the black community. So National Black Family Cancer Awareness Week is pretty new. Uh, it's actually only a couple years old now. Um, the FDA Oncology Center of Excellence began this week in 2021, and it coincides with the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act and the signing of a presidential executive order. It started out as a week-long social media campaign to increase cancer awareness in the Black community. And now it's actually a year round project uh, looking to increase clinical trial participation in cancer trials, as well as looking at minority population specimen donations as a way to get more uh, tissue information for cancer research. So for our objectives today is to understand certain hallmarks of cancer, uh, to review preventive screenings for the first, uh, the first four uh, cancers uh, that affect uh, all communities, but particularly the Black community, and then explore clinical trial options and current research uh, geared toward the Black community. Uh, what is cancer? So it's a term for diseases in which abnormal cells divide without control. So they have unlimited replicative potential, and they can also invade nearby tissues. That's how they spread, by direct extension. Uh, cancer cells can also spread to other parts of the body through both the blood and the lymph systems. The lymph symptoms are lymph nodes, like you have underneath your neck or underneath your arm, that are connected throughout the whole body, and that's how cancer can spread through the lymphatic system as well. So in 2023, it's estimated this year, approximately 1.9 new million cancer cases will occur with unfortunately about 609,000 deaths. And when we look at 2020, uh, the census showed us that 46.9 million Americans uh, identified as black or African-American, which accounts for about 14% of our total US population of almost 330 million. Cancer continues to be the second most common cause of death in the United States after heart disease. And with regards to the top three uh, cancer cases in men, prostate is number one, lung is number two, and colon is number three. That's almost half, almost 48% of cancers diagnosed in men. With regards to women, the top three new cancer cases are breast, lung, and colon. And that accounts for just a little bit of half of the cancers diagnosed in women. So for most type of cancers, unfortunately, Black people have the highest death rate and the shortest survival rate of any racial and ethnic group. This can be because a disproportionate number of Black people we live below the national poverty level. But more importantly, there's still a systemic discrimination that reduces our access to cancer screening, uh, which allows for early detection and appropriate high quality treatment. In 2022, there were an estimated 224,000 uh, Black individuals diagnosed with cancer, with unfortunately about 73,000 deaths. With regards to Black women in cancer, we have an 8% lower incidence, but a 12% higher mortality uh, than white women. Black women have a 41% higher breast cancer mortality than white women, despite lower breast cancer incidence, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And Black women are less likely than white women to be diagnosed with localized stage breast cancer, so breast cancer that's earlier found um, that happens to be uh, diagnosed uh, less likely in Black women. 
And unfortunately, we have a lower survival for every stage of disease, um, early as well as localized, as well as advanced. And breast cancer surpassed lung cancer in 2019 to become the leading cause of cancer death among Black women. With regards to Black men in cancer, Black men have a 6% higher incidence than white men, but unfortunately, 19% higher cancer mortality. Black men are 73% more likely than white men to be diagnosed with prostate cancer, and unfortunately, more than twice as likely to die from the disease. And lung cancer actually continues to be the leading cause of cancer death among Black men. So what is prostate cancer? Uh, one of the number one cancers uh, of new cases in men. So the prostate is actually a walnut-shaped gland in males. It produces the seminal fluid that nourishes and transports sperm. It sits right underneath the bladder and right in front of the rectum. Um, the, you see on the left, a slide with a typical prostate, and you see on the right, a tumor shaped like a yellow uh, um, object on the, in the prostate um, that actually has a tumor in it. Usually prostate cancer is pretty slow growing and has very little symptoms. So when it becomes more advanced, unfortunately, that's when it causes signs and symptoms, such as trouble urinating, a decreased force in the stream of urine, blood in the urine or semen, bone pain if it's spread to the bones, if uh, men are un losing weight without trying, or if they do have issues with erectile dysfunction, sometimes that can be related to underlying concerns with the prostate. So what are the risk factors? Um, it's usually age. Um, it does increase as we age, as do all cancer risks increase with age. It's more common after age 50, but men can still be diagnosed obviously younger. Um, it's still undergoing additional research to determine why African-Americans and Black people are at higher risk of prostate cancer uh, than other races, because um, the cancer tends to be more aggressive and advanced. And so they are doing special testing on the tissue to get a better sense of which tumors need to be monitored uh, more closely. And with regards to family history, there are certain genes that certain families carry uh, that can increase the risk of prostate cancer. That would be the BRCA1 or the BRCA2 gene that can also increase risk of breast and ovarian cancers as well. And then our weight, obesity, it does increase the risk of prostate cancer. So those uh, with a, a heavier weight can be at a higher risk. So there's been some controversy with regards to prostate cancer screening. There's actually no standard or routine screening test at this time. However, the two most common screening tests that have been used are digital rectal exam. So an exam when uh, the doctor inserts the finger into the rectum to feel for the prostate to see if there's any um, palpable masses that are, are, that are noted. And then the PSA test, which is a blood test, measures uh, a level of antigen with regards to the prostate in the blood. And that's a protein, the PSA, the prostate specific antigen is a protein produced by the prostate gland. And when levels are high, this could indicate underlying prostate cancer. So despite the controversy in the screening, the American Cancer Society does recommend um, discussions with the doctors about uh, having screening and beginning as early as age 45 for black men and age 50 for other men of other races. So there are approximately 41,000 cases of prostate cancer that were diagnosed last year. That accounts for over a third of all new cancers in Black men. And it's thought that approximately one in six Black men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime compared to one in eight white men. And when we look at uh, four years of statistics from 2014 to 2018, there's actually been a rise in incidence of prostate cancer in Black men, uh, approximately a 73% higher rate uh, than seen in, in white men. So the concern, obviously, is the substandard treatment uh, that some Black men do receive for their prostate cancer. Um, often our cancers are diagnosed in later stage, and we're often offered less treatment options um, than uh, our white counterparts. And that can obviously, even when patients have similar insurance and economic backgrounds, that still is the case. But when treatment is similar, it's found that the 10-year survival between uh, Black and white men uh, is actually comparable, or even higher sometimes in Black men. Moving on to breast cancer in Black women, it's uh, the number one cancer diagnosed uh, in women, and uh, unfortunately, our uh, number one uh, cause of mortality for cancer in women, Black women. Breast cancer is most commonly diagnosed, um, with 36,000 cases expected last year. Um, the incidence is uh, actually lower than our white counterparts, although women that are younger than 40 uh, in the Black community are at a higher risk because of the certain type of breast cancer that they can develop. 
And unfortunately, uh, we do know to have a shorter life expectancy. The median age of diagnosis is younger for Black women, 60 years, uh, compared to those uh, 64 for white women. So triple negative breast cancer, that means the breast cancer lacks certain receptors. Often breast cancer is driven by hormones such as estrogen and progesterone, but there are types of cancers that do not express estrogen or progesterone receptors. And there's also a third receptor that they don't express called HER2 nu, human epidermal growth factor. So when you don't have any of those estrogen, progesterone, or HER2 new receptors on your breast cancer, sometimes the treatments that you can offer patients are fewer and less effective. And unfortunately, more Black women are diagnosed with this triple negative breast cancer as opposed to white counterparts. And then um, unfortunately, because of this, um, because there's less effective treatment options, um, they have a higher risk of death. Um, and then there can be additional cancers that can come later in life um, in these Black breast cancer survivors, so that also plays a role in their overall uh, prognosis. And although breast cancer in men is rare, there are types of uh, triple negative breast cancer in men that also uh, can be found. So how do we prevent and detect breast cancer early? So our weight can definitely play a role um, because often cancers are driven by hormones. Uh, we do secrete a, a weaker um, estrogen in our fat stores. So that can still stimulate um, the breast tissue. So although a lot of our, in black women, a lot of the breast cancer estrogen receptor negative, weight gain um, as we get older can sometimes contribute to estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. Uh, taking hormone replacement therapy, because that is an additional estrogen progesterone that we're exposing our bodies to, could play a role in breast cancer. Um, how much alcohol we drink and how active we are physically can also play a role. We do know that mammograms save lives, and it is recommended by the American Cancer Society to start your annual screening uh, at the age of 40. A concern, however, is how abnormal mammograms are responded to. There have been concerns for delaying callbacks uh, and that causing a disparity between black and white women outcomes, as well as gaps in insurance coverage uh, could play a role as why um, black women may have uh, less uh, survival. So lung cancer is also the second cause in both uh, men and women in the black community. Um, with regards to the most common uh, cancer, second uh, common cancer. Uh, lung cancer is diagnosed in approximately 25,000 uh, Black individuals last year. And again, uh, the incident rates were higher in Black men than in white women, and white men, excuse me, and, and lower in Black women than white men. And a lot of this has to do with smoking. While um, smoking definitely is taking a downturn, um, in past years, the smoking patterns, particularly um, in earlier years, uh, did play a role in, in all of these lung cancer cases. They estimate about 80% of lung cancer cases uh, resulted in um, a history of smoking. So 14,000 deaths from lung cancer were expected to recur last year in the Black community from lung cancer. And even though we don't really have a good way to screen for lung cancer and patients that do have a history of smoking um, that, that um, have quit um, within, the more that obviously you quit your smoking, the better chance you have of reducing future lung cancer risk. But for those that smoked um, for 20, 30 pack year history, um, there is a thought that you could do a, a CAT scan of the chest uh, to get a sense if there's any new nodules or lesions that are of concern. So um, unfortunately though, if you have the diagnosis and you don't have the appropriate treatment, that's gonna play a role in your overall survival. So numerous studies have shown that even when lung cancer is diagnosed early, uh, black individuals unfortunately are less likely than, than white individuals to receive uh, effective surgery. But again, as we've always seen when treatment is equivalent, the outcomes between black and white individuals uh, are similar. So colon cancer is the third most common cancer in uh, Black men and women, 20,000 cases last year diagnosed. We actually have the second highest incidence of colon cancer in the U.S. following the Alaska Native American Indian population. And incidence rates are approximately 20% higher in Black individuals than in white individuals. Unfortunately, uh, seven, over 7,000 uh, deaths occurred last year in our community. So how do we prevent colon cancer? You'll see again that our weight is a, is a, a risk factor in most cancers. Our health with regards to our sugar, type two diabetes. Um, if you're in, again inactive, that's we've seen that twice now that that can play a role in, um, in having a future risk of colon cancer. Long-term smoking is also a risk factor. 
Eating a lot of red or processed meat uh, can play a role. Not taking adequate calcium or adequate vitamin D can also play a role in future colon cancer risk. Alcohol, it's the second time we've seen that moderate to heavy consumption can increase our colon cancer risk and low intake of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. So it used to be 50 was the recommended age for colonoscopy. Now that we're seeing more uh, colon cancer in younger uh, Black individuals, American Cancer Society has actually decreased uh, the age of colon cancer screening to be the age of 45. Um, so that um, either sometimes you can do stool cards, you can do direct visualization with colonoscopy. They have the Cologuard available. Um, colonoscopy is really the gold standard because uh, that's how you can actually excise the polyps that are precancerous before they become something of concern. Uh, but uh, now the age has been changed to be 45 when we should begin our screening. Unless obviously you have a family history of concern, it's possible you could even begin your screening earlier. Uh, but those at average risk for the disease should start at age 45. So we know that there are health disparities in cancer. And as an oncologist, this is a very um, concerning uh, issue to me. Um, and we're seeing increases in our breast, prostate, endometriosis, uterine cancer. We're seeing increases in that cancer as well. And unfortunately, all cancers have a wide disparity in death rates uh, based on race. So this is from the American Association for Cancer Research. They list uh, seven different categories as to why there are health disparities in the United States, uh, environmental factors, uh, social factors such as education and income, cultural factors, stress and mental health, being psychological factors, genetic factors, clinical factors, and behavioral factors such as weight, inactivity, tobacco use, diet that we've discussed. But unfortunately, what they don't list here is racism. So the underlying source of health disparities among people of color is structural racism. This discrimination perpetuates through institutions and it's reinforced through our culture, our history, our ideology, and sanctioned practices. Uh, structural racism impacts all facets of life, it limits our accumulation of wealth. It affects how we live. It affects unequal access to work, education, housing, healthy food, and quality health care. And when we look at medical mistrust and health symptom implications, we know there's been a long history of racial bias in our healthcare system. Um, there have been multiple uh, studies that have shown the exploitation of Black people for medical advancement. There's unequal treatment at segregated hospitals. Uh, and then provider bias. Only 5.7% of physicians are actually African-American and only 5% of oncologists are African-American. So in that concern, there's not, um, there's definitely a long way that we have to go in medicine to diversifying our workforce so that we can uh, break these biases. The American Cancer Society and the American Clinical Society of Oncology are working earnestly to reduce cancer health disparities. Uh, the Community Health Advocates is implements a nationwide grants for empowerment and equity called the Change Program. And that's working to um, improve limited income or um, affecting insurance coverage in communities of color uh, by awarding community grants. Uh, the Lynx program, which I know is active in this Morris County, uh, works with the American Cancer Society, and they're actually um, developing health equity ambassador links. So those are actually community members who are trained as health equity ambassadors, and they work uh, to uh, affect, um, you know, uh, health equity and change in the community with health education. We know that the National Black Justice Coalition works with the American Cancer Society and the Cancer Action Network um, also works to uh, reach Black LGBTQ uh, communities um, to important, and important messages about cancer prevention and early detection. We know that the American Cancer Society is working with a variety of Black-led social, civic, and faith organizations, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, uh, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, which is also the Morris Tunnel alumni chapter is also uh, hosting uh, and co-sponsoring this Zoom session today. Uh, the Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity and Zeta Phi Beta Sorority are all organizations that are working on health equity and health education in the Black community. The American Cancer Society has also partnered with the LIFE Initiative uh, to spread awareness about cancer risk, prevention, and early detection in the Black community. And again, as I was mentioning before, how few Black physicians and Black oncologists we have, but ASCO 
again, which is the American Society of Clinical Oncology, is working to diversify the nurses and doctors that help patients with cancer as one of their key goals. Also trying to help uh, improve uh, the research and the research mentorship provided uh, to these uh, underserved populations, as well as continue to advocate for health equity. So what kind of research is going on, and particularly that's sponsored by the American Cancer Society to reduce cancer disparities? So one study is to look how social inequalities, such as factors affecting socioeconomic status and racial discrimination, contribute to racial ethnic differences in cancer occurrence. There's a cancer prevention study that's actually looking at housing discrimination and seeing that how that could contribute to inequities in cancer prevention behaviors and cancer risk. There are several studies going on in prostate cancer to see um, how we can identify and treat aggressive tumors within the prostate gland, particularly in the Black community, um, based on a, a genetic tool. They're looking in ovarian cancer to see if Black versus white women, particularly those that don't have health insurance, have um, are being able to receive uh, standard of care treatment. Uh, looking to see um, with reducing racial and socioeconomic disparities in the cancer burden, looking how to include differences in prevention, early detection, treatment, survival, and mortality. We know that the Affordable Care Act uh, did tremendous uh, things to broaden healthcare coverage for uh, many communities and trying to see if that's been an effective way to help reduce disparity and receipt of cancer screening and treatment. Uh, the American Cancer Society has also partnered with Pfizer uh, to look at breast and prostate cancer specifically to see um, how uh, patients in the Black community are having uh, appropriate delivery of care. There's a lot of advocacy that's also going on with the American Cancer Society, um, looking to end discrimination against people with cancer and other life-threatening diseases, looking how to expand access to care for people with cancer or at risk for cancer, and again, figuring out how to refocus the healthcare system on prevention of cancer as opposed to just treatment alone. So many um, state Medicaid plans uh, were some of the last major forms of insurance in the US and fortunately did not cover routine medical costs um, for people enrolled in clinical trials. Um, so now that there's been some expansion um, in Medicaid, the hope is that a lot of this will help uh, to increase clinical trial participation of black and other underserved communities uh, because they will have now appropriate insurance coverage uh, to participate. Uh, there was also a uh, passage of uh, the Henrietta Lacks uh, Enhancing Cancer Research Act uh, that was signed into law approximately two and a half years ago now, uh, and that's looking to be able to remove the barriers to participation in sponsored clin cancer clinical trials um, in communities that have been uh, traditionally underrepresented. Uh, it's estimated about 7%, I believe, of uh, cancer clinical trials are um, have uh, Black participants. And uh, obviously, if we're 14% of the population, that's not enough uh, to make any um, long-range conclusions uh, with regards to our cancer care. And then we're still working uh, with the American Cancer Society on the passage of the Diverse Trials Act, which is a way to increase uh, both racial, socioeconomic, and geographic diversity in clinical trials. I think that stalled uh, in 2021 in Congress, but the hope is still to, to revive that so that it could allow patients to have additional support with regards to travel and lodging to participate in these trials. The, we do have this uh, active um, organization here at Morristown Medical Center, uh, which is a national breast and cervical cancer early detection program. as a community-based breast and cervical cancer screening program that does help uh, low-income, under and uninsured women uh, in order to help uh, improve their uh, access to screening. Unfortunately, the current funding as a whole nationally only serves about one in 10 eligible women. Uh, nationwide. So we still have a lot of work uh, to do in this area uh, to improve this access uh, to all communities. So Black Americans and cancer clinical trials, again, um, the enrollment is quite low. Uh, that can be for a variety of reasons, but it's hard to make conclusions on cancer biology or response to therapies if you don't have adequate representation. Um, so that's a, a goal of the American Cancer Society, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and uh, most oncologists who are involved in research to try to diversify um, the clinical representation of the trial so that it's, a, it's an appropriate representation uh, of the whole community. 
So this uh, chart here looks at factors related to clinical trial designs. Sometimes patients aren't eligible for trials based on um, their additional uh, medical conditions. Sometimes the participating centers are uh, in larger academic centers that patients don't have access to. There's a lot of uh, enrollment and follow-up requirements that sometimes make it difficult uh, for patients to, uh, can, to participate in if they're working. Um, factors like the patients can include the access to care. Um, there's obviously a long uh, historical concern for uh, system or provider distrust based on how the uh, health community has treated African Americans in the past. Um, a lot of patients may not know these trials are actually open to them or aware of them, and not having uh, enough education about clinical trials as an opportunity to treat their cancer. And as we know, factors related to the health system definitely include racism. Um, some in hospitals don't provide incentives um, to the hospital to engage in research. And then unfortunately, there's still a lack of laws that enforce equal representation so that the, the trials are sufficiently powered to make um, suggestions for certain communities. So these uh, barriers definitely affect um, appropriate uh, cancer uh, clinical trial uh, enrollment. So unfortunately, in conclusion, and we'll have some good time for questions, cancer is a disease that does affect everyone. Um, unfortunately, as we know, it does not affect everyone equally. Um, health equity means everyone has a fair and just opportunity to prevent, find, treat, and survive cancer. Our goal is that we want to eliminate barriers and address needs to ensure everyone has the same opportunity to be healthy and cancer-free. We know early detection is power and that uh, power is very informative. It's important to be vocal in our community on the importance of cancer screening. It's important to vote and be uh, socially active so that we can uh, enact laws uh, that do uh, allow for um, adequate healthcare screening and treatment and definitely to learn more about clinical trials in our area. Uh, both here at Morristown uh, Medical Center and Overlook Medical Center in Atlantic Health, there are several clinical trials available to patients with cancer uh, that may be appropriate for you uh, if indicated. So I want to thank you for joining us. We kindly ask that you take a few minutes after today's webinar to complete the program survey. The link to the survey has been added to the chat for your convenience. And a special thank you to Dr. Chavo for dedicating your time and expertise today. If you have any additional questions or comments, send an email to communityhealth at atlantichealth.org or call 1-844-472-8499. That concludes our webinar. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.